Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. As that habitat fills and there's no more food source for those coyotes, they're coming here. I have this great personal respect for my dogs. Here you have a very large animal that is willing to fight to the death to save a weaker species. This takes a lot of understanding of how their mind Good operates, you know. And There's two different instincts. There's the chase and just don't care if you make a mess. And then there's the border collie that wants to gather the cattle, wants to control them. They're just really versatile. They're descendants of wolves, and the young dogs used to go get the herd stopped and then bring them back to the old dogs. Working dogs on this farm to fork Wyoming. Funding for this program was provided by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. On Wyoming's open rangelands, the working dog is as important to the rancher as the livestock itself. You know, if it wasn't for the guard dogs, we wouldn't have sheep here today, period. The wolves are here, the coyotes are here, and it's prolific coyote country. And so our guard dogs are the only line of, real line of defense that we have. Being the last guy in town with sheep is really a problem. The keeping of flocks and herds has always been tenuous, but made easier through our ancient relationship with the dog. I don't think that anyone really has any idea how long livestock guardian dogs have been used around the world. There is art that indicates that it's probably six to 8,000 years old. So we know that guard dogs have been used to guard livestock since then. Their use is very widespread. It's everything from domestic turkeys and chickens all the way up through sheep, goats, cattle. Um, they're actually used with water buffalo. Um, they're, they're used all over the globe. And there's another ally on the open range who gathers and herds. They are a tool to us. They're also, I mean, obviously companions too, but we couldn't do our work without them. We have a lot of brush and bogs and areas we can't get into that our dogs can to help us. They're always eager to come. Sometimes the kids aren't as eager to come. <laughs> Stuff like that. They're good employees. Yeah, great. <laughs> you know, we're, we're working with the BLM, in this case the Forest Service, um, on public lands utilizing these grazing permits. You have to have dogs and horses in my opinion. Um, it's just not something a guy can do on an ATV. The bigger range operations, um, cows are essentially free to roam up to 40,000 acres of, of the forest, you know, and that, that is a pretty good amount of land to cover. These ranchers and their dogs share a bond that was forged in a boundless landscape. The transhumanist method of moving with, with livestock by the seasons uh, was, you know, the historic way of doing things. And then we had various types of governments, whether it was communist government or what, wanted to take the free people off the landscape and have control of them. We know that that happened a lot in the former so, uh, Soviet Republic countries in, in Europe where they collectivized farms, where they brought all of the livestock in and, and actually um, bulldozed villages and had people move into more populated areas so that they were more easily controlled. So we lost a lot of that um, traditional migratory culture. But even where it's been lost, there was always some that hung on. 
whether it's the Bedouin or what, there, are, there have always been migratory people. People move with their livestock and, and with their livestock guardian dogs. It's an intricate interplay between man and the animal world. We talk about the relationship between like myself and my guard dogs, but my guard dogs have relationships with all of these other animals as well. They have the relationship with the entire flock as a whole, and then they have relationships with the individual animals in that flock. Guardian dogs are their own, their own dogs. They, they like you, they love their sheep. Sheep are highly social animals, and uh, some of them will, will develop a real uh, affection for certain guard dogs, and the guard dogs will uh, feel the same way about the sheep, and they will actually seek out those individual sheep, and those sheep will stand and have their faces licked by the dogs. And where herders must keep track of the sheep, these guardian dogs make that job easier as well. There is important an animal to count as the sheep. You see the red sheep? Okay, they count those red sheep every morning. Okay, there's about one to 50. They can make a fast count on those red sheep, then they know if they're missing any sheep. These dogs will stay behind with a sick animal. And so if they're missing a dog, they know that they've got something outlying away from the herd. And then you know, the dogs will hear them come to feed, they'll come and then go back to that animal. Well, they've just fallen back out. And we've had a lot less loss because of it. Because they, they won't turn loose of a sick one or anything that's straight off. If there's a coyote kill, they'll guard the kill. They'll sit on that dead ewe. And it's like, so and then when I look at the lamb and it's like, well, thanks guys, but you know, we can't do anything for this one. Then they'll take him off and eat him. Just as they have relationships, my dogs know the wolves and the bears and the moose and everything else that share the same range with them. They come in contact with each other on a regular basis. So just as I can see and recognize that, oh, well, this cow, moose, and calf have been here for so long, my guard dogs are the ones that see them more often than I do. Those guard dogs have individual relationships there as well. They know what is a threat. They know what's not a threat. Um, you know, they have, you know, we have skunks around here and stuff, and they're like, they're not going to hurt my sheep. And coyote comes along and, and he's gone. Or a badger, or, you know, defend against the wolves and the bears. I tend to look at guard dogs in terms of whether they're softer dogs or harder dogs. And softer dogs are just um, not quite as, ag as, as aggressive. They're more easy to handle, things like that. And I think that the Great Pyrenees um, dog is a perfect example of a soft dog. If, if you've ever met a Great Pyrenees dog, they're just the most lovely animals to be with. Once wolves really moved into our area and we started having a lot of wolf problems, that changed the process for us and what we needed from a dog. We try to run three breeds in a herd. The brown dogs are like these scout dogs. They'll be out three miles off this herd, okay? The heavier white dogs stay closer into the herds, okay? Especially the long-haired dogs because they heat up, get too hot. And then we have that smooth-haired line, and they're, they're not as rangy, what I call rangy. They don't cover as big an area as these, uh, these browns. Those working dogs will pick a fight. Mm -hmm. They'll go out and pick a fight with the coyotes. Then these guys come in and take care of business. They'll finish the fight. Fight starts, they'll finish the fight. These dogs will take on a bear, they'll take on a coyote. They'll go out and, and look for anything that's trouble. It takes us a week to 10 days to police up a, a, an area. So we'll pull in, because we're migratory. So we'll pull in, we stop. It'll take those brown dogs and those smooth-haired white dogs about a week to find all the carrion, all the dead, 
in the area, okay? Because that's the easiest food source in the country, see? And that's what coyotes like. Coyotes are, are well, they're, they're opportunistic, and so they take whatever is the easiest food source out there. These dogs will come in and replace the canine factor in the ecosystem. They'll, they'll police the area and move the coyotes away. First hostile action we have usually is enough to drive them away. And once we get that done, then we have peace in the valley. They go their way, we go our way. We don't know what we're gonna have with these wolves, you know, because they are not going to, I don't think, shy away as easy as these coyotes do. When wolves come down and are trying to come into the sheep, we have had so many actual actual battles between wolves and our guard dogs. And there are many times that the dogs can just um, bark and chase and be aggressive and make the wolves go away. But sometimes those the wolves come into our herd or try to get into our flock and it is a full on brawl between the dogs and wolves. And we have had so many guard dogs tore up and we've had several guard dogs killed. And um, that is a heartbreaking heartbreaking thing besides being an actual emergency that we have to deal with on the ground because those guard dogs are our single best defense against wolves you know they're the, they are the, they are the first thing that um, the wolves are going to encounter and they're out there with the sheep um, all of the time you know and that's a it's a pretty difficult thing to to go through it's going to take a multitude of animals we have wolves here now and they're back up in that mountain range and they come out in here once we leave. So we still have a deterrent factor, okay? We're, our dogs are enough that, you know, it's like leaving the lights on in your house. The thief is gonna come to your house and see the lights on. They're gonna go to the next house where there's no lights, okay? And that's what's going on right now is we have a deterrent, it's out here. So they don't come to us. Livestock guardians work because there are thousands of years of, of breeding and selection, selection for that guardian behavior. We use mainly um, Akbash, which is a large white breed of guard dog from Turkey. And then we also use Central Asian Avcharkas um, from Central Asia. We've, we really like crossing those two breeds in the natural breeding system that we have here. And that happens a lot in the guard dog business. You end up with somebody else's dogs. They end up with some of your dogs. It's kind of a touch and go deal. And that's kind of how it works. But it's, you know, they're rangy and they're hard to, in our environment, they're, they're hard to keep uh, with your own bunch, you know, because when we get on the winter ranges, there's 35, 40,000 head of sheep down there eight companies, nine companies, and so we all have our own dogs. Then we're back and forth trying to catch them. So what we've learned is we need someone like Cat who can make these dogs easy to catch. We don't really do much training. It really is natural instinct. But what we try to do is influence um, some of that behavior. Livestock guardian dogs are by their nature very independent decision makers. Um, they will decide what a threat is and how to react to that threat. It's okay. Hi, Panda. What we try to do is from the time they're very young, we try to um, socialize them or acclimate them to things that we expect to, that they will encounter later on in life so they will not be afraid of those things. We try to ride bicycles around them. We ride motorcycles, um, snow machines. We uh, have draft horse teams, men on horseback. Just a lot of different things. They have to know no. They have to come when they're called or when I whistle. They have to know the command, go to the sheep. So all good things happen while they're with the sheep. Here comes Harriet the Horrible. <laughs> Harriet, come here. <laughs> How are you this morning? Initially, we didn't humanize them at all, human habituate them at all. And so we couldn't get them caught when we needed them. But now we kind of catch almost every dog we have. Though herd dogs look predatory when herding sheep, guardian dogs understand their place. 
We we rarely ever have conflicts between the between the guard dogs and herding dogs. Uh, with the border collies, they have a, a relationship. They know that the border collies are there to move the sheep. I mean, there has to be a hum human supervision and, uh, you know, someone talking to those dogs to let them know that, no, they're allowed to be here. It's not like some stranger, even a friend, could come in with their herding dogs and work our sheep without having um, our guard dogs trying to take those dogs out. If the dog isn't a good work ethic, a nice, calm, going to be kind, kind to the sheep, uh, I've had Krius run out there and just flatten him. <laughs> he just like holds him down. He's like, you be nice to my sheep or you're not going to get to work my sheep. The Border Collies have a unique breeding because they bred them for 400 years in Scotland. The dogs that weren't any good didn't, didn't make it. You know, they were, they were called out. They're naturals at it, so it just makes your job so much easier if the dog's a natural, you know, if they have natural abilities. Collies were uh, initially really renowned for being sheep dogs, you know. Um, relatively, a kind of a, a new thing was adapting them to cattle. Because cattle are, are quite a little different than sheep. and, and the old argument with border collies is that they don't have enough power to be on a cow. You know, a, a healer might go in there and rip and tear a little more. The, the instinct of the border collie is to gather to you. And a biddable dog will, will gather to you on his own, but if you tell him, say, to go over here to nine o'clock and, and pull him that way, he'll do that. He'll come behind you, push him away from you, he'll do that. It's just. A dog that is willing to listen to you and override his natural instinct, and that is, you know, that's that is what makes him so easy to train. They're just yeah. really versatile. They're descendants of wolves, and the young dogs used to go fetch the or get the herd stopped, and then bring them back to the old dogs. You're the alpha person that they're trying to please, so they'll, they'll go around naturally to the, to the front of the stock. And their real, real strength is fetching to you or bringing them to you. And we take that away from them a lot out here uh, driving. The one thing that we work on a lot is being fair to the cattle, because that's really important. You, know? you have a relationship between the cow and the and the dog. And, and really, if the cow is walking away leaving, and the dog should give the cow distance and, and you have that respect. Whereas if the dog goes in and cheap shots him and gets her stirred up and she was leaving anyway, then then uh, then you got issues. You know, you're not respecting your cattle. It all comes down to a respect and of the cattle. They they have a lot going on. Cow cow pairs are really uh, the college work uh, of the border collies. They, the, the cow is trying to protect her calf. These, these dogs stir up the predator instincts in them. So you end up in some battles with young dogs. But it's trying to get that distance. Some of these old dogs will be walking along looking at cattle, and you don't even know they're working. Yet they're moving along, the cows are leaving, everybody's going along, and uh, they'll be real loose-eyed about it and stuff, but they, they've got, they're all business and they're working those cows. Some ranchers mix these breeds to suit their circumstances. We have our hanging tree collie line, okay? Pretty famous line, working dog line. Then we have a McNabb uh, line. McNabb line is a Scottish breed. It's a, it's a herding dog. This is a cross on a on a collie dog with a McNabb, they're pretty good. They're not barkers. But we have a bearded collie. We prefer the bearded collie, but we can't hardly hold the strain. They don't breed very well. We prefer a bearded collie because they're barkers. They bark. And so we don't like the borders as much because they have to go sheep to sheep to sheep to sheep to get them to move. But these bearded collies will get out and bark and gather the herd in these big areas, and they're a lot more resistant they'll make the trail. See, we're 175 mile walk one way. 
And so these boarders will wear their foot pads out. They don't hold up as well on the long distances as well as the bearded collie. They're a trailing dog. They're a dog that was used to move place to place. The boarders are, are work on a farm close in, okay? The McNabs have been good. They're really tough. And we're looking for tough. We're looking for tough guard dogs, tough working dogs, because this, this walk is what gets you. You've got to get something that can, that can make the walk. That's okay. So this is a blue Merrill, and it's got Collie, but its father was a, boor, was a Beardy. And uh, I saved her because she's such a pretty dog, and she's really smart. And we have fought that as Border Collie breeders. We want to breed for brains. Mm -hmm. Intelligent, working capabilities. And some dog that'll go out and watch a cow and work. Some fear that as working breeds become standardized, their working abilities will be bred out of them. There's a lot of dogs being bred that aren't working. You know, that they're being bred because they are, and they are personable dogs. They're, they're wonderful dogs, but they're, we're getting a little dilution there away from the from the wor actual working you know good dogs trainers they 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 fought AKC getting involved with uh, the breed because they they're they're worried they'll show them for show like the big uh, white collars and you know and a big dog maybe or you know and then pretty soon the dogs aren't working and you have problems getting the breed getting that back to working dogs because they lose something along the way Another thing we've kind of seen in, in the last few years is the in dogs, the hot dogs, you know, as far as the this dog's win and everything. So, well, let's breed to him. Well, all of a sudden you've got 500 of these bloodlines out there. Well, that's a pretty, pretty big chunk of our genetic pool that all of a sudden we've just, you know, they're all that. And, you know, you see these dog trials and they put sheep in a pan and do all of these things and they go way out, you know, 1,500 yards, 1,000 yards, and you can still talk to them. You know, that saves that man a lot of steps, right? These fellas here, we don't have a line of dogs that do that. We have a line of dogs that'll go out about 300 yards and do what you want and come back. And that's, that's okay, that's okay. Those long distance dogs get real, they're real busy. They want to be busy. And so they start doing things on their own without supervision because they want to be doing something. So you'll see in a lot of these camps that have those high powered dogs, they'll have the dog chained because they can't leave them without them being here. These guys, these guys, well, you can see. They're in the middle. They're not lazy, but they're not really super ambitious either. It's cool like to be able to find these dogs that are out on the ranches that are doing doing the work every day and and then to me that's really neat to be able to bring that bloodline in. It may be, you know, something totally unknown. I'm not going to spend $5,000 for a dog that can go out there and and you can whistle at you know, I'll raise my own dogs. These dogs will come from, we had one dog jumped out of a pickup truck and came 44 miles on his own back. I raised my own line of horses. I've had them come 110 miles, cross an interstate and a railroad track and show up here to where they were birthed. These animals make these trails up and down. They know them. Those guard dogs know. I've had these guard dogs have puppies and bring their puppies back 35 miles. Different countries and different dog experts will tally up uh, dozens and dozens of these breeds. But if you look at the way that they've traditionally been used across Central Asia and Europe, um, I guess I'm not so concerned with trying to define breeds because, you know, um, I look at them as more as land races, you know, that these were dogs, that these were uh, sheep and cattle and goats that move to migratory systems along the Silk Road, for instance. And so you have different people um, that, are, that are moving with their animals there that have different kinds of dogs, and they would actively trade and sell those dogs. And so you'll have uh, dogs that are of a certain type and a certain location, you know, and, but that's how, that's how breeds came about. But breeds are really the, 
the world of you know putting a pen to paper and this is this is defining what this breed is and I think that there's a huge variation out there across the landscape. Say so that's that's something I think we do need to be aware of and so we don't go the way of the AKC you know more more pretty more you know less performance oriented and and more genetically uh, locked down. The working dog thing, the, the guard dog thing has been a quantum leap for us. But yeah, if we're successful, everything works here. It's all about, it's all about this migratory movement thing. We're the last of this deal, and the most important thing that I have is the knowledge. We have um, active programs in place around the world, various countries do, to try to get people um, back into the, into the transhumanist system. And Spain, for instance, has a very active program. Italy is very much um, encouraging and supporting the, the use of that system. You know, if you want a good food production system and security, you don't want to have everything clustered in one area. And so they know that the livestock are able to use landscapes that um, are not appropriate for farming. Farm to Fork Wyoming is available. Order online at shop.wyomingpbs.org. This program was produced by Wyoming PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. To learn more and watch Wyoming PBS programs online, visit us at wyomingpbs.org.